Hi, Aten. Uh, this is your first lesson for um, Year 11 content, Biology B2. So we are going to be looking at asexual and sexual reproduction as the first lesson in the inheritance topic. So your first task today is to answer the do now questions for me. So you've got four questions there on the screen. What is reproduction? What is a chromosome? What is a gene? And where is DNA stored? So I'd like you to do those four questions in your book, please. If you pause this video, then you can look up the answers if you wish. If you can't quite remember from last year, that's absolutely fine. Just pause the video and then come back here when you're done. So we will be working through the differences and the similarities between sexual and asexual reproduction with this lesson. At the end of the lesson, you'll be able to identify organisms that reproduce via either a sexual um, reproduction method or an asexual reproduction method. And to be able to explain the difference clearly between the two, so you will be able to compare and contrast um, the sexual and asexual reproductive techniques of, um, of organisms. Okay, so we're looking at some different organisms that reproduce in either of these ways. Okay, so your um, teacher will have supplied you in the Google Classroom folder for this lesson, um, a Google copy of this worksheet. So this is a recap of genes and DNA and chromosomes, and um, it has all of the key terms in there that you will need to make sure you understand fully as we head into the inheritance topic. So what I'd like you to do now is to open up this document which will be in your classroom. It is a Google Doc so you will be able to type in the uh, missing words in each of those boxes. Obviously if you need help use the biology textbook for reference or you can use Google to help you that's all fine but this is an exercise in making sure your knowledge of all of the key terms is secure. It's not a test it's a recap task, okay? So pause this video for me and then come back here when you are done. And this um, can be submitted straight back to your teacher on the Google Classroom, okay? See you in a moment. Okay, so um, when we talk about reproduction, we can talk about the two different modes, which is sexual and asexual. And the reason that they are different is because um, one sexual reproduction requires two parents, a male and a female, and the fusion of genetic material between them both. Asexual reproduction does not require to parents. It is a, um, a way of producing an exact copy of the original organism. So the, the individual that's produced is an absolute exact genetic copy. Okay, so that's the difference between the two. It's not um, anything to do with physical connection between the two organisms. Okay, um, although, you know, it's completely understandable why that misconception is there, but you need to kind of leave that bit to one side and just think about um, do the organisms that are produced have two parents or do they only have one? OK, so to go through sexual reproduction, the offspring that are produced from this method, they inherit their DNA, their, their genetics from both their mother and their father or their, their male parent and female parent, okay? So the genes that their parents carry may be inherited by the individual, okay? It is completely random, completely random, which of the mother and father's genes the offspring will inherit, okay? So that's why brothers and sisters can sometimes have some similarities um, and other times have some quite different characteristics because they will inherit some genes from the mum, some genes from the dad 
and the way that they're actually um, the, the way that they're inherited is a completely random process. OK, so we need to um, remember to talk about gametes rather than sex cells. So gametes is, is the much better word. It's the more scientific word and the one that we do use at GCSE and at A level. If you can't remember it, always just just write sex cells or write, you know, a description, sperm and egg. That's OK, too. But try to remember the word gametes because that is um, that's tier three vocabulary, which is specific to science. And it's the best one that you can use. So our female gametes in humans are called eggs and the male gametes are called sperm. OK, um, and in the case of human fertilization, one egg will fuse with one sperm to create offspring. OK, and that process of fusion where the sperm actually penetrates the egg and its nuclei fuses with the nuclei in the egg, that is fertilization. So they fuse and that's the point of fertilization. And then you have a genetically unique individual okay so it is genetically different from either both of its parents because it has genes from the mum and the dad okay so what you can see in the graphic at the bottom is that the egg so the the sort of latin name for an egg is ovum um, this contains 23 chromosomes okay humans have 46 we have 23 pairs okay but only half go into our gametes and the sperm then contained the other 23. So when fertilization occurs, the nucleus from the egg and the nucleus from the sperm fuse and then the resulting nucleus contains 46 chromosomes, which is the normal number of chromosomes for a human embryo or a human being. OK, so when fertilization is complete, that resulting cell is called a zygote okay it has 46 chromosomes arranged in 23 pairs 23 of those came from the mum and 23 came from the dad and if all goes well that cell starts to divide and then differentiate into specialized cells forming the embryo Um, so this is a nice little example. This is embryo development in fish. Um, the majority of, of animals that have been studied in embryonic form that, that uh, go through an embryonic stage, um, they look remarkably similar. Um, humans look the same as fish and frogs and, um, and you know, loads of different organisms, they, they all look very, very similar. Humans look very much like tadpoles to start with. Um, we end up looking quite different, but the initial stages of anything um, in its embryonic stage, if it has a backbone, it looks remarkably similar to uh, a human embryo, which is quite interesting. If you have a look around for things like that on the internet, just, just be careful, make sure you've got your search filters on. Um, so start from the top left, what you can see actually is an egg that has just been fertilized. In the second picture, you can see that it started to divide into two. Now that division will carry on and it will repeatedly divide so that um, it becomes a, a ball of cells, like a cluster of cells. And every single one of those cells is absolutely identical. It's got the same chromosomes in it. It's an identical cell, but it's able to turn into anything. We call these stem cells because they've got the, the ability to differentiate into any cell in the body, which makes them so unique. Um, then at, at, at a particular stage in the development, it, um, the, the cells will then differentiate into specialized cells and form different structures in the embryo. When all of those structures are complete in the human pregnancy, that's usually around 12 weeks. Um, the structures are, are all complete. They've just got to get bigger. OK, so the last sort of six uh, months of, of pregnancy is just the embryo's growth um, and, and the development of the organs to, to mature enough to be able to survive outside of, um, of the uterus. So 
then we're going to look at sexual reproduction in plants, which always does sound a little bit strange, but I know you've done some of this in year seven and you'll understand um, exactly what I mean by that. We're talking about pollen and we're talking about ova. So the ova is the egg of the plant cell, of the plant. Yeah. Um, so you know that plants reproduce sexually. It's nothing to do with contact between plants because a lot of plants, flowering plants, rely on pollinators and they can be birds or, or insects or other animals that um, will brush past the pollen on one plant and, you know, quite literally brush past another plant um, and the result is the pollen is transferred from one plant to another. OK, we always think about bees as as pollinators. They always come to mind. They are the most important pollinators um, in terms of, you know, the reproduction of plants. And, and for us, food security, um, you know, they're, they're incredibly busy and they rely on the plants as a food source. The, the distribution of pollen is accidental um, on the part of the bee, but very deliberate on the part of the plant. Um, so they will transfer pollen from one plant to the stigma of another plant. And the stigma is the female part of, um, of the plant. Um, the pollen lands on that and then literally just grows down and actually goes into the ova and fertilizes the ova inside the ovary at the base of the flower. Um, pollinating, um, so flowers that rely on pollinators are usually quite brightly colored um, or you know uh, highly scented large flowers where um, the, the reproductive organs are actually deep inside the flower so that the insects or the birds or whatever have to go inside um, to drink um, nectar and then as they do so they actually pick up the pollen on their way in and their way out um, and that's how it works. Um, some other plants rely on the wind for pollination. They don't tend to have fancy flowers because there's not much point um, in the flowers being particularly uh, nice smelling or very beautiful because they're not trying to attract insects towards them. So they tend to be very simple flowers and the anthers, the, the, the part of the plant that sort of sticks out of the flower and has the pollen on it, they tend to be outside of the flower because there's no need for them to be hidden away inside. And then when the wind blows, a cloud of pollen will literally just come away from all of those flowers, drift through the air and, and hopefully land on um, another of the species and fertilise it. Um, and at different times of the year, you get different pollens. And um, when people are sensitive to types of pollen, um, and I, if, if grasses are um, are flowering and you're sensitive to grass pollen and at particular times of the year you'll be affected you, you'll have hay fever at particular times of the year or tree pollen different tree species will um, will flower and release their pollen into the air um, through the wind at different times of the year so that's why um, if you have hay fever you wouldn't necessarily have it all summer but you might be really bad with it for a couple of weeks um, in the warmer weather and then it kind of goes away and that's because whichever plants are flowering at the moment, whichever wind pollinated flowers are, are flowering, that's the one that you're sensitive to and that's letting all of its pollen go. But uh, it works in exactly the same way. Once the pollen lands on the, on the female part of the, of the flower, it works in exactly the same way. The, uh, the fertilisation, the pollen grows down inside the stigma into the ovary and will fertilise the egg. So if we then talk about asexual reproduction, so some plants um, and a really, really good example of this is the strawberry plant. Now, the strawberry plant will uh, reproduce asexually, but it's also capable of reproducing sexually and it does both. So it's it's a highly efficient plant. It's you know, it's, it hasn't got all of its eggs in one basket, to, so to speak. So it will send off these little um, plantlets so you can see on these little runners and they look like stems, but they kind of lay across the ground. And the reason they grow that way is so that the little plantlets will actually land on the soil and then they will definitely 
the, the cells at the base of the plant that would differentiate and become roots and it will actually root itself. And then the little sort of um, the stalks that they grow on, they will just kind of die away. The original mother plant will be there, but it will be surrounded by identical copies of itself. And the strawberry plant, as if you've ever been to pick your own and or you've grown strawberries at home, you know that they produce flowers. Um, so they will actually uh, reproduce sexually as well. And they would rely on pollinators like bees to come along and transfer pollen from one strawberry plant to another. But they will produce these runners with these little plantlets all the time um, to, to make sure uh, the, the species survives essentially that's what reproduction is all about is making sure that there's a, a successive generation um the other one on the page that you can see is a hydra and that is a little aquatic organism another one that sort of um kind of does a similar thing is a starfish um, starfish is capable of regenerating a whole new starfish from a fraction of a limb um which you know when you've got um troublesome ones like the crown of thorns that can cause real problems if you don't uh, get rid of them in the right way anyway the hydra forms little buds on its sort of stalk it is it is an aquatic animal it's not a plant um, but it forms this little bud and the bud kind of grows and grows its own tentacles and then when it's ready it just detaches from the parent and is able to sort of feed for itself so the tentacles kind of stick up from the top um, catching bits uh, of, of food and sort of debris in the water and that's what they they feed off the important thing to remember about asexual reproduction is that the indiv individuals that are produced in this way are clones of the parent they are exact copies of the parent they are genetically identical it's not enough just to say identical OK, you could have two identical plants that doesn't necessarily mean that their genes are the same. OK, so when you have an organism that is the result of asexual reproduction, it is genetically identical to its parent and it only has one parent. OK, so a couple of other examples that you need to know about the amoeba, which is a single celled organism that lives in water, copies its nucleus um, and other organelles inside the cell and then quite literally just splits in two. Um, the other one on the page is yeast. This produces little buds, a little bit like the hydra, this one produces little buds. Um, and when the buds are fully formed, they uh, detached from the parent cell and you have um, another exact copy, genetically identical copy of the original parent yeast cell. Okay. So quick learning check here. What I'd like you to do is to just divide your page in your book in half and then write the statements under the two headings sexual and asexual so you need to sort them out into the right headings and write them into your book and when you've done that um, come back here and we'll do the last bit so just pause the video for a second and then come back here when you are done there's an extension also at the bottom of the page um, and that is to name some organisms other than the ones we've talked about can you name any more um, that reproduce uh, and obviously name them and state if they reproduce sexually or asexually. OK, pause the video and come back here in a second. Um, the last one that I'm going to talk about is bacteria. Now, um, bacteria obviously is a single celled organism, a microorganism, and it does produce clones. It does copy itself. It doesn't use sexual reproduction. It only reproduces sexually, uh, asexually. Sorry, um, but the process that um, that bacteria use is called binary fission. It is slightly different to um, just budding or, or dividing in half um, because bacteria don't have a nucleus so they use a process called binary fission uh, it would be a really good idea to look that up see if you can find a youtube video um, i'll see if i can find a good one for you and pop that onto the classroom as well um, so yeah just remember that bacteria use 
binary fission to produce clones or genetically identical copies of themselves. But this is different from the budding that we see in the hydra and the amoeba. So this often comes up when we're teaching um, about clones and identical um, individuals. So uh, identical twins, it's really important to remember that identical twins are only actually clones of each other. They're not clones of their parents. They're not identical to their parents because they are the result of sexual reproduction. OK, so uh, they are the result of a single egg being fertilized by a single sperm and there was an extra division in the early development of the um, embryo meaning that two individuals were formed from the same genes from the same fertilized eggs so they've got exactly the same genes as each other they are genetically identical but they are genetically different from both of their parents Okay, so your task is to complete the six mark question um, that you can see on the screen, and that is to compare and contrast sexual and asexual reproduction. So I've put some tips on there for you. Um, when, we, when we compare and contrast, we need to look at both the similarities and the differences of, of the thing in question. OK, so you need to talk about both. You need to say what's similar and what's different. OK, so you, when, when we compare, you need to say, well, this one does this, but this one doesn't. It does that. You know, they've got to be real comparative statements um, to make sure that you get full marks. And because this is a six mark question, I always say, you know, just just write either bullet points or statements, write six of them and make a point in each one and then you can see really clearly what you have and haven't covered rather than trying to write a massive paragraph which you don't have to do you can do bullet points absolutely fine you can draw tables for six mark questions it's not a it's not a um a, a format specific question it's just get the information on the page so um make sure that you talk about both make sure you're making comparative statements so one does this but the other does that one has this but the other has not okay um, six points in either six statements or make um, six points making do, do three statements each making two points comparative statements say one has this but the other has this then you would make two points in one statement and that would get you two marks. OK, um, there is a support slide um, that I will put up now. So you can just if you're going to do this one, you might want to hang on for a second. If this is really uh, making you feel uncomfortable doing a six marker, um, then hang on. If not, then pause this and complete the six mark question here and then submit. You just do it in your book and then you can take a photo and submit to your teacher. OK. Um, I'm going to put a support slide up and it's for any of you who might need a little bit more help. It's a little bit more structured. So if you're happy doing a six marker, stay here. If you're not happy, I'm going to flick the screen now and then I'm going to show you what the, the, um, the more structured one is. It's got a little bit of scaffolding that might just help you a little bit. OK, so this is the second one. So this is, is a little bit more structured and you've got some key terms there at the top of the page that might just help you out a little. Um, so if you feel more comfortable doing it this way, then that's absolutely fine. But remember to write it out in your book, take a photo and submit it to your teacher via the Google Classroom. OK, that's it from me today. Good luck with that last task. Take care of yourselves and I'll see you soon.